Hello and welcome to Miss Hannah Loves Grammar. In this video we'll be concentrating on the poem She Walks in Beauty and the messages it conveys alongside its methods as used by Lord Byron. So George Gordon Byron, as we know him today, Lord Byron, was born into an impoverished noble family in London in 1788. Now the legendary life that he led was actually coloured by some really challenging circumstances in his childhood. His dad left the family home and left taking the money with him and his mother throughout his youth really struggled with mental health problems. Now he clearly had to step up as a young man uh, in that family home but I think he rebelled quite a lot in his youth. You may know him as famous for his wild frolics and adventures he is famous for his notoriety. He is famously called Mad, Bad and Dangerous to Know. A very cool uh, triple if ever used for a poet. Though at the time he was writing, Byron's romantic poetry was widely condemned for the morals it presented. As a romantic, he believed in free love, as we call it today. He believed that people should not be chained down to the ritual of marriage and instead should celebrate affection in its purest sense. It's interesting to note, though, what he's condemned for in his other poems is not what we need to consider within this poem today. So he wrote She Walks in Beauty, having seen his cousin, Lady Wilmot Horton at a party. It happened on June the 11th, 1814. And the story goes that she was in mourning dress, that's in black. Her beauty astounded him and he wrote about it the next day. This poem really concentrates on the value of outer and inner beauty and moves beyond the superficial lusting after a woman, instead to concentrate on the depth to what makes someone a beautiful being. The mere title, She Walks in Beauty, does something different. There is no comment here on our speaker's desires. In fact, the, the focus on the present tense of her walking in beauty signals to us there is an, a magnificent aura around this woman and we long to know what is behind her nature to make the writer speak in this way. Additionally, as readers, we really want to know what's behind this beauty, what accentuates her beauty, we long to read on. She walks in beauty like the night of cloudless climes and starry skies, and all that's best of dark and bright, meet in her aspect and her eyes, thus mellowed to that tender light, which heaven to gaudy day denies. One shade the more, one ray the less, had half impaired the nameless grace which waves in every raven, raven tress, or softly lightens over her face, where thoughts serenely sweet express how pure, how dear their dwelling place. And on that cheek and over that brow, so soft, so calm, yet eloquent, the smiles that win, the tints that glow, but tell of days and goodness spent, a mind at peace with all below, a heart whose love is innocent. The opening stanza of this poem echoes the title, She Walks in Beauty. And it signals once again our focus is on this woman and what makes her so impressive. But unlike what we may be expecting where beauty is often compared to light, the simile that is used compares her to night. The contrast though amplifies the sense that, well, she stands out in the night's she brings brightness to something dark. As we look through the imagery used in the opening two lines, it fits in perfectly with Byron as a romantic. 
They viewed beauty in relation to nature and purity alongside that. There's something so marvellous about the night sky being lit up by this woman, where there are no clouds and the sky is full of stars. It's as if she is a bright star in the night sky. The alliteration of the second line though, and more significantly the sibilance, cloudless climes and starry skies, amplifies the image of her being stunning and heightens for us as readers that she's impressive. She's someone to notice. And the third line and all that's best of dark and bright, well, frankly, her beauty, it contrasts to daylight. It's strikingly different. Dark and bright, it stands out once more. They often say that the eyes are the window to the soul and it says meet in her aspect and her eyes. So we really see that she's something different from just the mere gaze of her. But what makes this poem different is that it doesn't just obsess about the superficiality of her looks. Actually, there's an acknowledgement in the final two lines of this stanza. There is simple inner perfection that produces this beauty that's superior to nature itself. That's mellowed to that tender light, the verb mellowed there, humbled if you like, by the simple nature of that tender light, which heaven to gaudy day denies. So something so marvellous is beyond what she physically looks like. Heaven to gaudy day denies, I mean, that religious imagery there, it's backing away the night is the deeper level of her beauty. The way I like to see it is that light and dark impress each other here. They need each other to stand out. And she has both the features to stand out in the night sky, but also to echo her surroundings. If this poem is indeed about a woman who's grieving, the imagery of the darkness may well be more than just her mourning clothes but the fact that she's cloaked and shrouded in sadness. So the fact there is something of light within her seems to impress us as readers. There's hope for her yet. In this second stanza, we have the imagery of the perfectionist, actually. Our speaker is almost painting the image of her beauty through a really precise gaze. One shade the more, one ray the less. The contrast of more or less really signals her beauty is perfection to him. But beyond that, had half impaired the nameless grace. It's more than beauty. Her ability to light up the room with her personality, her countenance, is what we are concentrating on across this stanza. The use of the word nameless to describe is quite interesting, if nothing else. Words could not match her qualities. Her grace is so precious, yet our poet still tries to. There's some sort of irony in that. He wants to reward how marvellous she is. And he must try because she's so spectacular. We as readers are still thinking, what makes her so striking? What is it about this woman? By the third line, I love the attention to once again the imagery of the dark. This time her dark hair, her raven tress, which then follows through to her having lightning over her face, it lightens over her face rather. So the dark image of the raven tress contrasted to the light over her face. And yet once more, like we had in the opening stanza, that, that constant flitting between dark and light imagery really resonates this idea. She is striking, she is impressive. I also love the rhyme between grace and face. And the image of her with this whitened innocence over her face. 
and her having a nameless grace. It's as if you can see as clear as day on her face. She is a pure woman. She's an innocent woman. She is a lovely woman. The rhyme scheme of each of these stanzas being A, B, A, B, A, B really helps the simplicity of its message flow through. But the loving, marvellous features that Byron weaves into this poetic work is his concentration on something different. Now, metaphysical poets and those before often reduce women just to the objectification of what their physical look was. Here we see in this final two lines of stanza two, a concentration on her inner beauty and thoughts here, where thoughts serenely sweet express how pure, how dear their dwelling place. Serenely sweet express, the mere alliterative sibilance, if we like, ignites in us her purity once more. And we're concentrating on her thoughts. The repetition of how in the final line, how pure, how dear. These are really lovely qualities in a woman. And they rest within her soul. The most telling thing, by now in stanzas one and two, we have no comment from our speaker at all of his own emotions for the woman. This is not, I want to get you into bed. I need to be with you. This is all about her. In the third stanza, we really dig deeper into what exactly makes her beauty so special. And on that cheek and over that brow, so soft, so calm, yet eloquent, from the off here, the outward beauty has blessed her with inner perfection and purity. It has made her calm, it has made her eloquent and soft. And it's precise features. I like to see this stanza as a true living out of what true virtue would look like on a woman. She has smiles that win, tints that glow. And yet, from her mere look, you can see that she has spent her days in true goodness. It's a very glowing report, if nothing else, of a person. And the final two lines just bring out so much in the mastery of Byron's language. A mind at peace with all below, a heart whose love is innocent. This woman is clearly... In the, in the gaze of this as a poem as written by Byron at a time of a life where she's, she's mourning. But the final two lines suggest that this woman can bring out the beauty of both darkness and light without any contradiction. Her mind is at peace with itself. Her heart's love is innocent. She is purity. And she can light up the world with her personality. What a stunning description of a person, male or female, that is a stunning description of a woman, but it really resonates deeper than mere superficiality, as does the rhyme schemes that amplify its core message. As already mentioned to you, this A, B, A, B, A, B, rhyme scheme helps to convey the simplicity of the argument our speaker has. The fact it's also written in iambic tetrameter with eight beats per line is associated with simplicity and it's often found in hymns. This is about purity, it's about innocence, so it makes sense to have such a regular rhyme scheme with consistency at its heart. I think the metre shows that purity of intent. And I love the fact that Byron here is portraying such a pure and innocent message. And it really is evidence of how a poet can afford to be more than their own stereotype. Here he shows such a contrast to his other works. And it's a marvellous masterpiece at that.